Same recording. Oh, nice. So, anyways, today we're going over the. I get a lot of questions about the 6.6 .6 gas engine. Um, I'm going to play this video on the TV so we can kind of go through it. This is a fast lane truck video. I don't own rights to it. Um, these guys have a great channel on YouTube. Watch them. They get into all the new stuff. Um, you know, they do some old comparisons like viewer to buy. They kind of have a channel very similar to mine with about, about 100 times better uh, video production and things like that. They're not quite as uh, redneck and unrefined as me. But um, I'll kind of go through the 6.6 .6 and what what I like about it, that part will be really short, and what I don't like about it, which will be most of the video. Um, so we'll kind of get into this, I'll play it, and we can kind of, they'll go through a breakdown of the engine, I'll kind of bring into layman's terms, and I cannot even explain why Chevy um, uses the words they do sometimes when they're going through this stuff, but we'll, we'll get there in a second. Available for this unique heavy duty segment. So start with a blog. How does, does the blog compare to the 6 liter or how does that work? So what's, you, what's common between the 6 liter and this is they're both great cast iron materials. Sir. But if you look, this is really the architecture is common with uh, more of our Gen 5 architecture. Okay, it. So it's the great cast iron, but it's got all the lessons we've learned for light weighting where possible from the Gen 5 architecture. But of course, this block is unique for the heavy duty segment um, with that material. We've also in improved the, uh, the the cooling. Um, it has uh, inner bore cooling, so the side. What he's pretty much saying is inner bore cooling is right there between your cylinders. Um, they're going to have little water passages so that water jackets can make the water can make it all the way around the cylinder entirely. That's a good thing. Um, I don't know if it's like a major break difference in any scenario, but um, when you're trying to squeeze this much power out of a uh, small block, you're going to have. That's a good thing. One of the good things about the 7.3 large displacement, there's more places for the heat to go. That your heat dispersion is going to be much better. Um, yeah. It's bore, but it has a, a cooling jacket, a little uh, bores between them to allow coolant to flow to reject some of the, the heat that you may uh, accumulate during uh, heavy duty use. Okay, well, let's touch on some of the unique points of this center. Sure. Uh, 401. Pretty good power, 464. That is an impressive number for a small block, um, being at that RPM. And that's a pretty good number. It's not not the 7.3, but um, you know, that's uh, it's not bad. 10.8 to one. Not super stoked about that. Um, that's just getting high, and you're starting to get into higher drive pressures and and things like that. Um, you know, not a terrible thing, but it's just one more thing to kind of just more stress on stuff. Okay, um, so one of the things that we're most proud of is the introduction of direct injection into this uh, heavy duty segment that is an industry first. So as you can see here, um, the, uh, the... So industry first, he says that, um, he means in the uh, terms of the heavy duty market, direct injection has been out for a while, Toyota's used it for a while, and what Toyota has run into um, is the intake runner here, your, um, it'll, this, your intake, that's an exhaust valve, but we'll use it for or kind of explain here, but your intake valve, your gas should come in. On a multi-port, you got an injector up here and your gas comes in and it cleans that valve off every time it goes through. It keeps the carbon off. Well, now you don't have that gas working as a detergent in there and um, that you've got intake valve carboning and what Toyota has done to combat that, it's gone with another set of injectors in the intake runner to, I think, run it an idle to help clean, keep that clean. Um, there's things you can do, like VG makes a product um, that's a throttle body intake cleaner that works really good. If you do that, um, I'd say, I don't know, 25, 50,000 miles, that'll be all right. But uh, just another thing you gotta do. Um, this is a, a, one of my biggest concerns right here is you got a high pressure fuel pump, expensive to replace, destined to not last overly long because of, there's no lubricity in gasoline. You've got a sweet fail point here of where gas can go down into the crankcase. Um, gasoline, like I said, has no lubricity, dilutes your oil and likes to flatten cams. So that's a that's a cool deal. Um, yeah, um, high, you know, direct injection injectors running under high pressure. Um, the days of your $30, $40 piece injectors are now gone. You're probably in this at least, I, have, I don't know, um, I, I can't find any online yet, but um, I, I cannot imagine they're less than, than $300 a piece. Um, you're gonna have a service life on them because of the high pressure and uh, you know, you're just gonna have wear parts more stuff to go wrong, you know, it's like they're taking every everything that's a benefit. The reason that I go gas 
um, is to avoid expensive repair get repair costs and improve um, improve like long term durability, right? And um, the fuel the biggest problem with the new diesels is the fuel systems uh, to meet emissions. So now we're going to take that technology and how much it sucks and put it into this and uh, make this suck too. So that's cool. Fuel comes in at, from the low pressure pump at 400 kPa, comes through to the high. KPA is like 55, 60 PSI, somewhere in there. I don't know why, why they use those words. Like, use it so everybody can, can relate it to something. I mean, come on. Pressure fuel pump, which is actuated off the camshaft here in the rear, and our is increased up to 15 megapascals. Megapascals. It is mm, America, and this is the form of measurement that they want to use. Megapascal. It's like 2,000. 2,000, I think it's like 2,200, 2,500 PSI, somewhere in there. Why? Why, why, why would they use that term? Because everybody goes, holy crap, that's pretty high fuel pressure for a gas engine. Why do we need that? That's destined to wear something out. So we're going to use it a megapascal and, uh, and use a term that nobody's familiar with and nobody uses. And I guarantee when they designed this engine, they designed it using uh, pounds per square inch on the fuel system. And yeah, so that's cool. Um, the other thing on the fuel system that he won't touch on is this is a deadheaded fuel system. They have no return line going back to the tank because they want to keep the gas cool. Um, because you know, always under this kind of pressure, you're going to, you're going to get that gasoline and like diesel fuel the same way. It gets hot. Um, so I'm trying to keep that tank temperature down to keep you from evaporating all of your fuel out of the tank because um, our high pressure fuel system is now superheating your fuel, and so they they deadhead the pumps and everything, which it's going to make things um, kind of loud um, and, and a little less refined. It won't be that big of a deal in terms of noise, but just another another weird thing we're going to screw around with, um, get into some new technology stuff. And uh, see, the thing, so I really don't like this system, even though my Ranger has it, um, but I'm not depending on my Ranger. I'm not pulling long and hard every day. Um, and I, you know, my, my Ranger is not part of my business. I bought it as a screw around truck. Um, I, this is not an engine I would buy to depend on and have for 250, 300,000 miles and try to make your money back with. Before it uh, comes out from there into the, uh, the actual fuel rails and then injected directly into the cylinder um, with a very, uh, very specifically engineered shape and geometry in the bore to make sure that uh, we have the right mixing of fuel. What that enables us to do is with the, the atomization of, of the gasoline, it allows us to increase the compression ratio to 10.8 to 1, which allows us to meet uh, industry leading torque of 464 foot. This guy uses the word megapascals. Don't be like him. Pounds all on regular fuel. Okay. Um, so that not only increases the peak torque, but also extends the, uh, the torque range. We have 20% more torque throughout the entire speed range. So whether or not you're pulling stumps or pulling a large trailer up the hill, this engine has no compromises. It can uh, have that, that 464 foot-pounds of torque, 401 horsepower, all day after day after day. We know our heavy-duty customers. This is their livelihood. If there's an issue with the engine, they may not get paid that day. So some of it... So we're going to make it overly complicated and put expensive parts back into it so you lose the benefit of a gas engine over a diesel. Those other concepts, um, one thing you can see, uh, this is a hyper eutectic piston for strength, forged powder metal rod. PMR rods have been around for like, well, I know the Power Stroke has used them since 2001, so breakthrough technology. Uh, it is a, a forged steel crankshaft. Forged steel cranks are like in everything. Every your lawnmower probably has one. Stainless steel exhaust manifolds to handle the additional heat. Um, and all those uh, basically lead to uh, the uncompromised durability of the, of the engine. Okay, what's going on the front here? Sure thing. Um, some of the other key features I'd like to point out. Um, variable valve actuation. It is a dual equal system, which means the intake and exhaust. Variable valve timing has been out forever, but that's definitely something that is why you want to run good oil to keep those scam phasers and stuff and your slack adjusters um, 
um, from showing excessive wear, because as soon as they start to show wear, that engine's going to act up real bad. It's actuated off one camshaft. Um, it is still the push rod technology that uh, we have on our, our Gen 5 applications, and that allows us to have a very compact engine. The overall power density of this engine makes a lot of power and torque with a very small size. Okay. Uh, also, uh, industry first is the uh, variable uh, oil pump. What that allows us is to meet whatever the, the usage requirement. We recording again? Oh, nice. Anyways, sorry about that. I had to do a jet for a brief moment. Get back into this. Severe uh, towing a trailer up a large grade in the desert, or if you're just driving around unloaded in, in cooler climates, we will dial in the oil pressure to meet the exact customer needs at that time. So he's talking about the variable rate oil pump. Um, that's an all right deal. It's just more parts to fail, but like the N14 Cummins has run a variable rate oil pump. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the ISX does too. But I, I'm, uh, I don't know about CAT. But anyways, it worked fine in the N14. It was a good oil pump. Um, it would, it would, the nice part about it is in a hot situation, it would be able to keep up. Um, Keep your oil pressure up a little higher, um, but you know it's just it's more things to go wrong. Um, and if Chevy is calling for a zero twenty in this, like they do everything else for some reason, um, I don't know if they are. I hope they call for a five thirty, but a zero twenty is inevitably bound to carbon up and trash that oil pump, um, and then oil pump failure leads to total engine failure. Pretty cool, but at least um, so Chevy. I'm gonna take off on a little rabbit trail. The Duramax and the half tons. I cannot explain how much I hate that engine. I'll have to make a video about that, but um, that is going to be the, a throwaway truck. They're not going to have any resale value. If you want to crumple your money up and throw it out the window, buy one of those because when you go to sell it, as soon as the world finds out how much junker that is, um, after so, I'll just touch, touch on the absolute worst part that makes me want to puke and scream, and it's just like it just. Ugh. But anyways, they have a, in that little Duramax in the half ton, they have a belt driven oil pump, belt driven, belt driven oil pump inside the engine that has a service life of 100,000 miles, which is right outside your warranty, right? Boop. To service that belt, you have to pull the transmission out and then you have to pull the oil pan off and put a new friggin rubber belt on your oil pump every 100,000 miles. Um, if that fails, you've got... I mean, minutes, minutes, and that engine smoked. Um, boy, I could stay on that one for a while. I'll stay on the on the heavy duty stuff. Um, additional uh, for uh, cooling. Um, you met, you heard Jacqueline mention that uh, we have a very large uh, uh, mechanical fan for cooling that mounts directly to this water pump. This is a very specifically engineered water pump to handle those loads. One inch steel shaft uh, to make sure that customers have confidence in the cooling capability with, uh, with no, no issues down the road. Afterwards, chain driven timing. Chain driven timing off the crankshaft, as you can see up here through the, the, the cam fuser itself. Two valves, right? Two valves, uh, one intake, one exhaust for every cylinder. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the basic thing. Uh, one thing they didn't touch on. From what I understand, you know, Chevy used to have reactive fuel management, which turned out to be quite problematic and higher mileage stuff. The lifters would stay closed. You'd have to replace the lifters. Um, and most of the time, um, like what I've done for customers is we just delete that. Um, we go to a regular camshaft and, and just get rid of it because the mileage difference is not significant enough to keep around those problematic parts. Um, the Chevy used to do it on just four cylinders. And from what I understand, Chevy now does that on all eight. So now you've got 16 piece of junk lifters that are bound to collapse and stay closed at some point. And yeah, I mean, I'm just, yeah, I'm not excited about this yet. Who knows what Ford, maybe Ford will go to direct injection. They'll figure out this is tough and proved and proven and worth it in the heavy duty world. But um, for terms of, of cheap parts, this isn't your engine in terms of um, like long-term reliability. I don't believe this is the engine. Compared to the simplicity of the Godzilla, um, the big block design, like it's such a tried and true design. That's like that's like Cummins re-debuting the N14 or or Cat bringing back the, the 6NZ or the 3406E model or the B model or any any of those good old 
mostly mechanical engines. Um, you know, like the Godzilla is really close to the 460 Ford, and that was a phenomenal engine. Um, you know, and, and yeah, if I had to pick for one or the other, I would pay ten, fifteen thousand dollars more for the Ford than this. I just not, I'm not excited about this. Um, I like the idea of a big displacement, um, just like. You know, when it comes to working, bigger is better. Um, you're going to work a bigger engine, not as hard. Lower compression ratio of the Ford keeps drive pressures low. Um, just creates, takes a little less stress off things. Multi-port injection is a simple and cheap design. Um, this fuel system is a deadhead design. I think I touched on that already. There's no return line to the tank. Um, it's just weird. It's crazy stuff because what happens is the, uh, the fuel gets hot in the high pressure sit scenario, and um, and they don't want to return to the tank and boiling, boiling your gas and evaporating all your gas out while you're going on the road, which is a sweet deal. Um, so that's why they did have the, it's a one-way fuel system like the old carburetors, except at 15 megapascals or whatever he says, uh, which is 2,200, 2,500 psi. Um, so yeah, I hope you learned something from this video. And if you don't take anything away, take away, don't ever use the term megapascals if you're an engineer at any company. Be a man and talk in numbers that, and, and use terms and units of measure that we're all familiar with so we can understand you're essentially kind of designing a piece of crap. But um, yeah, there's my rant. I'm not, not that stoked. It might be a good engine. It's hard telling. It's fairly new. Um, but that's why, one of the big reasons why um, I'm just a Ford guy. I think that I truly think that Ford is, is looking out for the, the working guys out there. Um, that, that Godzilla is, in my opinion, like that's a it's a it's a blessing because of its simplicity. You know that's a truck that's worth your money to buy over a long period of time. That's a truck that's an investment. It's not going to be a headache forever and ever. Um, but yeah, there's my quick rundown. Um, so yeah, the God the, my Godzilla's gone. Sold it to a buddy. Um, yeah, we'll do the hundred thousand. When it gets to a hundred thousand, we'll take it apart and kind of see what she looks like. But um, take the valve covers off and just kind of get an idea. Put a bore scope down in the down through the spark plug holes. And, Kind of see how she's handling it, but you know, as of right now, when I sold it at 60,000 miles, I was doing good, and those are 60,000 miles hooked to a trailer like 95% of the time that that, that truck existed. Um, so it's and it's doing good. We did service the transmission, um, everything checked out pretty good there. Um, but yeah, no, no problems, not one one missed day of work that truck had because it uh, the battery quit us, um, but you know. I take that back. I didn't even miss that day of work. It went to work, but you know we could. The heat, my brother-in-law was still running at the time, and he, he couldn't shut it off, so he just left it run all day. So um, we got it back, and Ford came out and put a battery in for us, and because it was all under warranty, so um, they came out and did that, and it worked out really good. Um, but yeah, I was kind of wondering what um, the YouTube, what my got people that follow me, what they want, what I could help somebody with, like what. What trucks are you wondering about? Do you wonder if we go like if you were to tow heavy with the old 8.1 or or the V10s, how they would handle? If you're looking to get, a, get into a cheaper, um, kind of higher torque gas engine, or um, just whatever you guys, I'm looking for a suggestion somewhere to go with this kind of a route with this channel since I don't own a Godzilla at the time. I don't plan on buying one right now. I'm kind of hoping to. I'm, I'm rolling back my expenses a little. Um, I'm not too sure. Where Biden America, Biden's America is going to take us here for a bit. It's, it's kind of scary to think about, but um, everything will be good. But I think it's a good time to roll back some expenses and some overhead I don't need. That was um, truck number seven, that Godzilla of mine to have. And it's like, well, I just didn't need it. When he approached me about buying it, it's like, you know, I let it go. And then I still get to keep an eye on it. I'm still going to do services on it, um, things like that. So we can, we can kind of keep the series going with that. But... Yeah, this is Fast Lane Trucks video. I don't own it. Um, go check out their channel and watch it. Subscribe. They're a good, good bunch of guys. They uh, get into some neat stuff, and, and they're always um, kind of on the front end, forefront of the the new technology and stuff coming out. And they get to go to stuff like this, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, they're actually not too far from me. I think they kind of operate out of Longmont up there and the Eisenhower Tunnel, where they do all their tests. We run that with um, trucks all the time. So pretty cool. They're kind of a, a local outfit to me. But anyways. Yeah, go check out their channel. Um, that's kind of my two cents on the 6.6 .6 gas.